Okay, so we're going to have a look at complex numbers, which is the first chapter of Core Pure Year One. And really, this is where I think further math starts to feel like really different to normal maths. So we're going to actually figure out what complex numbers are and how we can understand and manipulate them. And then we're going to use this to solve some quadratic equations and some cubic and quartic equations as well. So let's get started. First of all, I want to talk about different types of numbers and actually what numbers actually are. So I've got this little diagram of these five apples because this is really the primary way that we think about what numbers actually are. So maybe we would say that these five apples can be represented by this symbol as a five. So I guess one of the ways that we use numbers is for counting, and that's called the cardinality of something, to be able to count how many things that there are. And complex numbers is when we move into this whole new realm of type of numbers. And in fact, we start beginning by thinking about these numbers that are called imaginary numbers. And I want to think about what an imaginary number actually is. I've said here that in a way, you've actually been using other kinds of imaginary numbers for a while, just not these ones. So if we go back to this idea of there being five apples, well, the kinds of, I think, an imaginary number you've already been using is maybe something like negative numbers, maybe like negative three. When you really start thinking about it, how can we have a negative three apples? We're already start having to start imagining negatives as being something else and some other way of thinking about them. Lots of the time people think about negative numbers on things like temperature scales or maybe um, in a building going below into the basement. But these are all ways that we try and deal with something that isn't physically there in front of us. We can't physically have negative three apples. So we've already come across this idea of imagining numbers to help us to solve other problems. And this is exactly what imaginary numbers, i, is going to be. So what I've written here is that i is equal to the square root of negative one. Now, the square root of negative one, you've probably come across this in GCSE, but you can't take the square root of a negative number. And I guess this is, is pretty obvious why, but just to kind of recap why this would be, if you multiply two positive numbers together, you obviously get a positive number. And if you multiply two negative numbers together, you also get a positive number. So if you were trying to take the square root of a negative number, you can't find a number that would actually match. You can't find a number that would multiply to give you that. So the square root of minus one is i. And I suppose um, alongside that, we might be able to say that i squared is therefore equal to minus one. Um, hopefully that makes sense that if you were going to ask yourself, what is the square root of minus one? Obviously, it cannot be equal to one because one times one is one. And it also cannot be equal to minus one because minus one times one times minus one is also equal to one. So we have to come up with this new number, which is I, and it is for the square root of negative one. So I've written some key facts at the bottom here. An imaginary number is of the form b i, where b, and I'll come across this language a bit more, this thing means is a member of the real numbers. So b is basically just a number. So for example, an imaginary number could be i, or it could be 3 multiplied by i, or minus 2i, or i multiplied by pi. A complex number, on the other hand, is of the form a plus bi, where both the a and b numbers that we have here are real numbers. So a complex number is a mixture. It's got like a real part and it's got an imaginary part. It's the two bits combined together that makes a complex number. So for example, we have one plus i, that's a complex number. And we have three minus two i, we've got the real part and we have the imaginary part, which is minus two i. So we say that a is the real part and b is the imaginary part of the number. Let's actually explore a little bit more about these kinds of numbers that we have here, because they might help us to understand and organise different kinds of numbers. So this type of Venn diagram that we have here is to try and represent all the different kinds of numbers that exist. So to start off with, we have very, very um, small group of numbers. Well, they're not that small, really, are the natural numbers. Now, the natural numbers are called natural because they're like the numbers that you count. So they might be things like one, two, three, four, five, etc. And some people might put zero inside there, but not all people do. The integers are more broad because the integers will also include things like negative numbers, maybe like negative 3, negative 110. And integers definitely includes 0 as well. So you can see that the natural numbers are actually contained within the integer numbers that we've got there. 
We then have inside these rational numbers. Now, rational numbers are ones that can be written as fractions. So maybe something like three sevenths or two ninths or 113 over three. These are all examples of rational numbers. But then, so with something like 1.2, which is actually just six over five. And also things like minus two fifths, because rational numbers don't have to be positive. They just need to be expressed as a fraction if possible. And then we have the irrational numbers which belong on the other side. Now, irrational numbers cannot be written as a fraction. So an irrational number might be something like root 2 or maybe like pi or a number like e that you could come across or even things just like, I don't know, 3 root 7. These are numbers which cannot be expressed in the form a over b. They cannot be expressed as a fraction. And really these two groups of numbers, the rational and the irrational, they come together to make the real numbers. There aren't actually any numbers that belong in this green section that are here. They are either in the rational section or the irrational section. They either belong in one of those two groups, but together they are the real numbers. And then what we have over here are the imaginary numbers that we've just talked about. So the numbers like the square root of minus one. In fact, things like the square root of negative anything, maybe the square root of minus 25. Or we could have that written as just i, 3i, minus root 2i. All of these things are examples of imaginary numbers. And then complex numbers actually cover everything altogether because complex numbers could be a mixture of real and imaginary numbers. So complex numbers, like we just spoke about, could be things like 3 minus 2i. It could be pi minus root 3 over 2i. It could just be a mixture of these kinds of things. And I'm going to mention this now, but actually complex numbers cover all of the numbers we possibly ever could need to discuss maths. OK, so we don't need any extra numbers. These are absolutely all of the numbers that we need. And you might think, hmm, well, I wonder if I took the square root of some of these things. Maybe I need to have some new numbers as well. But we're going to explore that later and see what happens. So let's have a quick look at some of the complex number basics that we've got here. We're going to see if we can write the following in terms of i. So using your knowledge from um, thirds, we can say that the square root of 36 of negative 36 is the same as the square root of 36 multiplied by the square root of minus 1. Well, the square root of 36 is 6 and the square root of minus 1 is i. So we have here that it is equal to 6i. We're then going to do the square root of minus 4. So we can split that into the square root of 4 and the square root of minus 1. So that becomes 2i. This one is going to be the square root of 7 multiplied by the square root of minus 1. Well, the square root of 7 I'm just going to leave as the square root of 7 and i that I've got there. Now, sometimes people write this as i root 7, just so that the root 7 doesn't look like, sorry, just so it doesn't look like the i is belonging to this root 7. What I like to do is just pull that little, um, that little part of the square root symbol. I like to pull it down to show that I'm only square root in the 7 and not the i. So we're going to look at this one. We're going to do root 45 multiplied by the square root of minus 1. Well, the square root of minus 1 is going to be i, but I want to play around with this root 45 because root 45 is the square root of 9 multiplied by the square root of 5, and that's all multiplied by i. So we end up with 3 root 5i. And again, I might like to pull that little root symbol down so that it doesn't go over the i. So pretty straightforward there. We're now going to have a look at some simplification that we've got. So with these kinds of numbers, I've got a complex number and a complex number. You just do exactly what you'd expect. So you're going to add together the real parts, first of all, which is just six. And then the imaginary parts that kind of behave a bit like bits of algebra. You've got three I plus I is just going to be four I. Expanding the brackets, you're going to have your i, and you've got minus 3 times 2, which is minus 6. Minus 3 times minus i, that's going to be plus 3i. And then we do start with the real parts. We'd probably write minus 6 plus 4i for that one that we've got there. And then last of all, with division, you can see this is dividing each part separately. So you could do 10 divided by 3 and 6i divided by 3. Well, 10 divided by 3, I'm going to prefer to leave that as a fraction. And 6i divided by 3 is just going to be 2i. So you can divide the real parts and the imaginary parts separately. So that's kind of your um, introduction to complex numbers and imaginary numbers. You can now have a go at exercise 1a and get some good practice in there.